Hello everyone. Welcome to our Monticello live stream. We're talking with Thomas Jefferson as interpreted by Bill Barker. Today we'll be talking about wine. Please add your questions in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Oh, beg your pardon and yet welcome indeed. Back to El Monticello here, if you will, uh, overlooking uh, all of the vineyards to the to the southwest and those further to the northeast. Yes, why? Because our subject today, once again, is wine, a necessity of life with me. Delighted that we have Mr. Christopher Barry with us in order to, well, engage your questions. And so, therefore, without um, well, further hesitation, though I would certainly appreciate if you would allow me just one, just one sip. I'm ready, Mr. Barry. <laughs> We've gathered here at Monticello upon two previous occasions to discuss wine. Do you think there is more to talk about the subject of wine? Oh, my heavens, when do you end talking about the subject of build to the subject of the mind, in my opinion, a great energy for it, a great comforting of many, many thoughts to engage among so many people upon various subjects. So I do not think we're ever finished in engaging a commentary and conversation upon fine wine. Uh, nothing uh, so relevant to the habits of the cusps of, uh, of one's own palate uh, allows them more the influence to relish fine wines. We know you've enjoyed drinking wine since your youth. At what point did you decide to pursue cultivating wine at Monticello? You know, as a, a former attorney, uh, reading, of course, the, the laws of the former colony of Virginia, uh, it is noted that in the 16 and 70s, that there was a law made while uh, the capital of the former colony was in Jamestown, that any farmer owning more than 40 acres would endeavor to cultivate wine. Now, it was hardly known at the time uh, how we might cultivate the fine foreign wines, and in fact, uh, still very much subject unto the British Empire at that time. Uh, we could only trade uh, with England, trade through England. We were forbidden to trade with any kingdom of Europe north of the Cape of Finisterre in Spain. And so you could not possibly cultivate in the soil of Virginia very elegant European wine. Uh, we did have thereby uh, the, well, Wheatus, if you will, uh, Rimbusca, and we had the uh, Rotunda Flora. Yes, that is the Muscadine grapes, the Fox grapes, we could cultivate them. And in Virginia and Carolina, it would be the Scuppernaw. So my point being, the wines that we were able to experience brought from Europe were essentially Port and Madeira. Uh, those that were fortified in order to make the voyage across the Atlantic. I can assure you, perhaps the first time I tasted an elegant foreign wine was as guest, a uh, guest of former royal governor Francis Falkia, uh, there at the governor's uh, palace in, in Williamsburg. A young boy, a student at the old Royal College of William and Mary, you can rest assured that a sip of such an elegant foreign wine made its impression. So much so that when I had the opportunity to serve our nation as minister plenipotentiary at the court of the late French king, Louis XVI, it was there during my time in France that I made a pointed investigation of many of the vineyards, many of the vineyards throughout France and as I ventured into the northern Italies, throughout the Piedmont in Italy, to understand better uh, the production of elegant wine, viticulture as it is known, and to try and introduce that to our nation. What is wine production like at Monticello? Are the enslaved people who brew the beers and ales also in charge of producing wines? Well, uh, when you're referring to Peter Hemmings, of course, who is a master, absolutely the most enlightened uh, brewer and uh, providing malting as well, uh, so successful at that, uh, I'm afraid that we've had to rely on other laborers in order to try and cultivate uh, foreign wines. That is the, the Vitus uh, vinifera, 
the foreign uh, vines. Now, I can tell you that Wormley Hughes, who has, of course, endeavored to help cultivate our gardens here for many years uh, at Monticello, has also made an effort to help, help cultivate uh, fine wine. But we really have not an expert, uh, if you will, in wine production here at Monticello. We did at one point, so it was believed, when uh, Filippo uh, Mazze, uh, M-A-Z-Z-E-I, uh, came to uh, try and cultivate wine within the vicinage, within the area uh, of Monticello. But lamentably, uh, that was not very successful. So in my uh, efforts to try and cultivate foreign wine, uh, by that I mean uh, the seven times that I've made an effort to do it, uh, it appears to be something within the soil here at Monticello and the surrounding area that prohibits uh, the roots of foreign vines of the Vitus uh, vinifera to root properly. Can you tell us more about your neighbor, Philip Motze? Indeed, he was my neighbor for some time. Um, I met him for the very first time in Williamsburg uh, when our, our capital was there during the colony of Virginia. It was about, well, it was before the war. Uh, let me see, when was that? About 17, I believe about 17 and 73. Yes. Yes, when it was, 17 and 73. He had been provided letters of introduction by Dr. Franklin. Uh, they had met uh, in France before Dr. Franklin returned uh, to our nation uh, in 17 and 74. It was about that time or the next year in 74 uh, when uh, Senor Matze uh, was making a, a trip westward to the Shenandoah to understand whether there was the possibility of cultivating foreign wines, that I invited him to visit here at, at Monticello. My dear daughter, Mrs. Randolph, a young girl at the time, uh, was wont to, to say that she heard so many talk about Mr. Matze and I going out uh, into the various fields and uh, across various farmlands to inspect the soil as to what might be appropriate. I gifted him thereby with 150 acres. Uh, and later on, in about 17 and 78, he purchased upwards of about 700 acres more. He named his farm Colle, C O L L E. Rather quaint in Italian, it means the small hill, uh, right next to Monticello, the small mountain. So it was there that uh, Signor Mazze and I beg your pardon for my pronunciation of his name. I even write it in my memorandum books and account books, M-A-T-S-A-Y, uh, Senor Maze. Uh, Senor Maze was the very first uh, most knowledgeable vineyard that we were able to welcome into the West to attempt to cultivate uh, the Vitus vinifera. That's really fascinating. Um... We have actually a question from one of our viewers that asks, do you have any particular preference from wines from a particular particular region, Italy, France, or Germany? Well, I think there's no question indeed, if you will, that I prefer the, um, the French wines, particularly those from the, the south of France. A belay, I consider, that's B-E-L-L-E-T. I consider one of the very finest wines uh, in the south of France, a, a white Hermitage. I, I certainly favor. Uh, then, of course, you're talking about two distinct regions in France uh, when you're talking about to the west in France, or Burgundy, Bourgogne. I favor, of course, Pomard and Volney, Merceau, Montrachet. And then if you're going, uh, uh, did I say to, to the eastern France, when you go to the western France, there around Bordeaux, I favor Margot, Lafitte, Latour. Uh, and Haubriand. And never, never let us discount, if you will, the Sauternes. I think the finest Sauterne to be discovered in all of France, at least in my taste, is Chateau Iquem, uh, there in and about Bordeaux. When your guests dine with you at Monticello, do they exhibit the same preferences for wine as you, or do they like any other wines in your wine cellar? Well, wine, I believe, is subjective as to what one's personal taste may be. And therefore, simply because I prefer some of the uh, elegant uh, and clear uh, red wines of the south of France does not mean that someone else may as well. So I try to provide an abundance of wines 
uh, at the table here at Monticello, as I did in the president's house, and uh, and it allow folks to make up their own uh, preference and suggestions for what they would like to be served. Um, now, I also uh, delight in serving sherry. I shall not deny that. Uh, I find that a very elegant wine. So I prefer that to be offered. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, some of the white, let alone the red wines to be served. This I did in the president's house uh, to many who came there to, to visit. So it's according to individual's taste. I remember the late general, uh, that is His Excellency, President George Washington, uh, preferred a champagne. Uh, he thoroughly enjoyed champagne, but not uh, as I came to know it uh, when I visited Champagne uh, there in the eastern regions of France around Rheim. Uh, I mean those uh, white wines cultivated in Champagne that uh, were made mousseau, that is gaseous, uh, so that they could then be exported and, and make that journey across the ocean. Uh, that is the Champagne that we have become most familiar with. Uh, here in our nation, the Mousseau Champagne, the Gassier Champagne, and that is what President Washington preferred. I find it fascinating that the inhabitants of the region of Champagne in, in France uh, have always and continue to enjoy the flat white wine. That is what they drink daily. That's really interesting about these foreign wines. And you've talked about you and your neighbors' interest in wine cultivation in the United States specifically. Uh, already, and one of our viewers is interested in, in learning more about uh, wine cultivation in the United States during your lifetime and what kinds of grapes you grew or hoped. Well, as, as I mentioned, the grapes that are indigenous uh, to our nation uh, are essentially the, the fox grapes uh, and the muscadine uh, grapes. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, the, the muscadine you could refer to as the scuppernong grape. It's a very brisk. Uh, and sparkling uh, wine that is want to be derived from it. Um, these are the wines that we have ever been able to cultivate. These are the wines, if you will, that were essentially uh, those by law to be cultivated by a farmer if he owned more than 40 acres. Uh, but when you realize uh, since, of course, the victory of our American Revolution, that we can now trade more extensively across the globe, you have to uh, understand and realize what foreign wines can suffer the voyage, make that voyage across the Atlantic in order to be available here uh, in our nation. And we discovered that that is more or less, when you're talking about elegant wines, when you're talking about the Vetus vinifera, that you're talking about the red wines for the most part. Otherwise, as I said earlier, uh, those wines that have always succeeded the, the, the voyage and the crossing were the, the fortified wines, Madeira, uh, if you will, and Porto, Porto, Porto in Spain, the fortified wines. Now, you, you've talked about these conversations. You enjoy dining with your guests over wine. Do you have any conversations you remember over a glass of wine, over a meal with your guests? Well, there's hardly any subject that is left untouched when you enjoy uh, an elegant uh, glass of wine. And when I'm talking about an elegant glass, this is um, the size of my wine glass. You might say about uh, three ounces. I usually prefer about, uh, oh, three sometimes four. By doctor's prescription, uh, I've been ordered at least two a day. But when I'm in the company of good friends and relations, well, then I want to treble that. And remember, too, when you talk about conversations, one of the great advantages that I discovered while I was serving our nation in France was the fact that when you are enjoying very elegant wine, and, uh, and I have always enjoyed it after the meal, well, then you have to be very cautious about what you're saying. And while I was in France, I noticed that the French utilized what you might call a wine elevator. Uh, you might refer to it as a dumb waiter. And I mean no disparage to any that are serving within the Salle de Manger. But what it allows, of course, is for the wine bottles to be brought up from below uh, the dining chamber, and uh, by a contrivance, uh, it was usually uh, cut into the hearths uh, there, the fireplaces, to be brought up as an elevating of wine, and then that could then be taken out of that uh, little closet 
uh, and served. I was usually the one who enjoyed uh, serving wine in the president's house uh, when it might be brought in on also a, um, uh, what would you call it, a, uh, a series of shelves uh, uh, that would roll in on coasters and the shelves would not only have the, the platters and the bowls of the food to be served, but also to allow for wine bottles to be brought in. The reason for this, talking about conversations, is you want it to be certain that any uh, most um, seriously and secretive points of conversation to be discussed might not be overheard uh, by those who are there simply to bring in the platters or the bowls of food, let alone the wine. Hence, uh, a dumb waiter. Hence, a wine elevator. So that is what I've constructed here at Monticello. And uh, that is not to say that when Mr. Colbert, Burl Colbert, uh, is want to come in and, and serve the wine, that uh, we would rather he not be there. No, quite the contrary. Uh, Mr. Colbert is like one of the family, and so all of us together uh, are certainly trusting of one and the other. But for the most part, in the delightful and enlightening conversations that we have here at Monticello, well, then uh, we will use that dumbwaiter uh, there within the side of the, of the fireplace, of the hearth, bringing the wine up from the wine cellar below. Did you always plan to have a wine cellar at Monticello, even before the dumbwaiter? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I can tell you that, that having the opportunity to ride back and forth between Shadwell Farm, where I was born and grew up, uh, and all along the uh, north bank of the James River uh, to Richmond there and uh, across the Chickahominy farther east uh, to Williamsburg, uh, you had the advantage to visit some of the, the great mansion houses of the large plantations, uh, Shirley of the Hill Carter family, and uh, Barclay of the, of the Harrisons, a uh, Westover, if you will, of the Bird family, and to notice that they prized uh, their particular wine cellars. Uh, now, for the most part, as I mentioned earlier, that would be the Madeiras and Porto Porto uh, that would be offered. But yes, in my construction of the very first design of Monticello, I designed in the cellar to, to have a space of, for wine and, and directly underneath uh, the dining chamber. Uh, I can tell you that I, I think when I was beginning, if I can recall correctly, when I was beginning the first uh, house, the first Monticello, that was back in the, the late 60s, the early 70s, that, that I did indeed intend to have a wine cellar. And that is eventually uh, where the wine cellar has, uh, has remained located. That's really interesting. Um, now, one of our guests is, is really interested to hear uh, more about the uh, advice that you potentially gave to your successor at the White House. Was it in regards to wine in particular? Is that true? Well, yes, that we should never have, um, particularly a state meal, a formal meal, where, where so many of um, foreign nations here as minister plenipotentiaries and ambassadors are visiting and have been accustomed to very fine and elegant wines uh, served throughout the kingdoms of Europe that they might not discover the same here in our nation. Uh, my suggestion has always been offer the finest, offer uh, the finest that we have been able to import uh, there at the table in the president's house. The finest varieties, and I, I think they have all agreed, at least of course, of President Madison, President Monroe, that offering, and by the way, uh, President Monroe certainly had the experience uh, when he was serving uh, overseas, serving our nation there, to taste uh, some of the finest wines, uh, that they have discovered that these are of great benefit uh, to very enlightening, engaging conversations. And when you think so many different individuals of different political opinions, of different points of view, of different philosophies, may be gathered about uh, the table there in the president's house, uh, looking upon our nation perhaps um, as a little more primitive than they are want to presume their own, uh, maybe. Well, then to see fine wine being served uh, is to to help them understand, as I have always wanted, that our nation continues uh, to rise and place itself on that plateau of civilization uh, that all other nations that I was able to visit 
uh, appear to have achieved. Who knew that wine could say so much about the United States? <laughs> I, I wonder if, if your uh, preference for red and white wines um, influenced how you thought wine could be cultivated in Virginia. One of our guests is curious if you ever thought about using um, apples or fruit in the wine production process. Well, to tell you, uh, wine could actually be cultivated uh, from many sources in nature and flowers and the like and various plants. <laughs> Never underestimate dandelion wine. Uh, a dandelion wine uh, is very uh, tasteful at times. But when we're talking about those elegant wines, those lines, wines that provide a great conviviality and a source of health, never underestimate that wine, in my opinion, is indeed a source of maintaining good health, a panacea uh, for ailments, let alone conducive to good conversation, that, uh, that yes, much can be involved in the cultivation of wine. Now, of course, when you're speaking about uh, apples, uh, well, then you know that's predominantly put to making cider. But if you're talking about the flavoring of wines, the different ingredients that go into wines, that which you can engage, if you will, in, uh, in taking mm, the aroma of a wine even before you sip it, then yes, you can smell various elements of fruits within that particular wine. So within that regard, yes, of course, never underestimate uh, what can be um, created in the great varieties uh, of wine to a much um, higher sense of delight to the palate. That is what is the essence, is it not, of the relishing of wine. Wine as a panacea sounds absolutely wonderful. One of our guests is actually curious about why doctors would prescribe wine. Because, in my opinion, if the ailment is not so acute, and when I say acute, perhaps requiring a harsh liquors uh, as a medicine, then wine can be uh, somewhat settling, uh, if you will, to the nerves, and, uh, and thereby be the more agreeable uh, in allowing for whatever is to ail you uh, to pass by uh, the more easily. Now, I am not suggesting an overindulgence, not by any means, as I told you earlier. It's only about two or three, maybe to an extent four uh, of these after the meal uh, each day. But uh, I do think that it is a great preservative uh, of good health. I'll have to keep that in mind next time. Now, can you talked about wine and fine dining at the president's house. Um, what purpose did wine serve? Did you ever toast at the president's house Ooh. while you were there? I think many of you may know that during the days when we were the colonies of Great Britain, uh, providing to the health, that is toast to the health, was very, very common. And it oftentimes continued on and on and on at one meal solely. Uh, one offering uh, a toast to one's health or another than following through. And of course, everyone then was obligated uh, to have their glasses continually filled and to continue to proper toast. Now, talk about overindulgence. That's not a toast to one's health. And so therefore, though I was accustomed to it growing up, particularly in the old former capital of the former colony of Virginia, particularly when gathered at the governor's palace there. Later, later when I took up the high offices in our new nation uh, as secretary of state, as vice president, and finally as chief magistrate of our nation, no, I dispensed uh, with that custom of proffering toasts uh, to one's health. I, I found it somewhat, if you will allow, somewhat monarchical, and, uh, and I personally did not want to, um, to um, favor it uh, as I presided over the table. Well, we have one more question for you, Mr. Jefferson. Now, one of our guests asked and is interested in a classification system for wine that you may have developed. Is this true? Oh. What was it like? As a matter of fact, I think you are referring to uh, what I wrote uh, to a gentleman not very long ago. It was uh, 
one Mr. Stephen Catherlin, and um, I wrote down what I considered to be a, a classification of wine to my uh, particular interest. I'm presuming that this is what you're referring to. Uh, about, oh, let me see, there appear to be three or four uh, various classifications. Firstly, uh, the sweet wines. Sweet wines. There we are. Such as Frontenac and Lunel of France, uh, Patravetti du of Spain, Patravetti du of Spain, uh, Calcavallo, Calcavallo of Portugal. They are amongst the sweet wines. Then the acid wines. There's a distinct difference. The acid wines, such as Vin de Graves, Vin de Graves, Vin de Rin, uh, if you will, of, of the brine. Vin de Hochheim, again, of the Germanies, uh, are the more acid. And then the dry wines, the elegant dry wines, such as Ledinol. Ledinol, I think, a very elegant dry wine. Uh, and then the silky wines. Can you imagine how delightful to the palate may be a dry yet silky wine? And and by those I am talking about, and I cannot deny, uh, Madeiras that are, are, well, mixed with Malmsey. I think, as you can imagine, that allows you a very elegant and, and silky wine. Uh, the perfect the perfect wine I would I would desire to be rough. I would desire to be rough and yet silky at the same time. So there, that would give you more or less uh, my um, my categories of wine. I'm presuming that is is what you you are referring to. That which I have written down right here: high in flavor, low in alcohol. <laughs> well, uh, I. I presume then, uh, are there any further questions or might I have the great delight as we are about to adjourn uh, to pour this glass, let alone a refreshment for myself. I think that's all our questions we have for you today, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you. And see, this is an invitation for you to come visit again, come visit our vineyards here. Understand that a day in your visitation is well spent when we can enjoy a walk through the garden, reflections upon our history, recognitions of what we still must work to achieve in perfecting our American revolution for the benefit of every individual to hold those reins of self-government and equal and exact justice, all of which may let it be rounded out at the end of the day with a glass of elegant, elegant, silky, rough wine.